All right. Um, we have been doing Christmas stuff for the last few weeks. Before we started that, if you guys are new, if you're new here, um, we were in the middle of a series that I was doing on biblical worldview. And uh, the reason <clears throat> that I started the series on biblical worldview is because lots of people don't have one. And lots of Christians don't have a biblical worldview. One of the one of the things that uh, the Bible talks about is the fact that we need to have our minds changed. And uh, one of the passage that I've been using on that is out of Romans chapter 12, all the way through the series. And it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a, a, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Point being, I need to have my mind renewed. Point being that I don't think right. When I became a Christian, I was a messed up unit on all kinds of levels. Uh, one of the levels I was messed up on uh, was the fact that I was dead spiritually. And so God had to come along and give me some life. And so that's what the Bible talks about happens when you become born again, you get a brand new life. And so God changes you spiritually, but it's not just a spiritual issue. It's a, it's a uh, mindset issue too. I had all kinds of ways that I thought before I was a Christian um, and most of them were messed up. I was indoctrinated by the world, whether that came from my family or whether that came from school or whether that came from my friends. I had views on all kinds of issues that were exactly the opposite of what God has to say. And so one of the things that has to happen as it says in that passage, is I'm not to be conformed to this world. That means made in its image. I'm not to be in the image of what the world has to think. I'm supposed to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And so I need my mind renewed. I need a good, I need a good brainwashing, basically. A lot of people will say to you, your life begins to change because you follow Jesus. Lots of people will say to you, you're being brainwashed. You go to that church, you get brainwashed. You need brainwashing. Your brain is filthy, man, and so is mine. We all need a good brainwashing. And uh, it's a, you know, again, the idea of thinking uh, in, the, in the same ways that God would think. And so we've been going through and doing this, and this week I wanted to do a, a study on uh, some, of the, some of the issues uh, that are kind of rampant uh, around the world today. You know, one of, the, one of the things that you're going to run into is the fact that um, if you begin following Jesus, um, you are going to uh, run into radical intolerance of your views. The world loves to talk about being tolerant. I have never seen a society that's more intolerant than the one that we have right now. Um, I'm titling the study, uh, Biblical Worldview on PC Issues. And I'm not talking about Microsoft versus Mac. <laughs> <laughs> You know what PC is, it's political correctness. And uh, actually it's one of those things that I never thought uh, would get a foothold in the United States. When I first saw it on the scene, it was back in the late 80s, early 90s, in, in the colleges, um, I saw people talking about political correctness and I thought it would never actually take root in our country because we're, we're, we are so fundamentally founded on freedom of speech and especially in colleges. And now it's turned out that colleges and universities are the places, places where you are the most limited on what you can think and where you can go as far as your speech goes. It's ridiculous and it's nothing but bondage. I hate PC stuff. And so we're, I'm gonna talk about some, some issues uh, this morning that uh, the PC police will have a fit over. Um, one, of, one of the things that, that we've been doing is um, going through and I've actually been laying a foundation and so, you know, the Bible talks about the fact that I need to have my mind changed. I need to be renewed uh, as, as far as my mind goes. And we talk about the fact that um, we need to conform our, uh, our thinking to what the Word of God has to say. Well, to do that, you have to know it's the Word of God. And so those are some of the first issues that we talked about. How do we know that it's the Word of God? How do you interpret the Bible? and, and uh, that kind of thing. Because those are all the, uh, the loopholes that, that people try to use to get out of taking God seriously. Well, I don't know that it's all the word of God. And we dealt with that pretty thoroughly. And I, you know, that's your interpretation of the Bible. And we dealt with that really thoroughly too. And so if you weren't here for those studies, totally worth 
um, going back and checking those things out because I, I really do deal with the issues. And now, uh, you know, we've been talking about some spiritual issues. What about salvation? Uh, what about the afterlife? That kind of thing. And so now I want to get all up in your stuff. <laughs> I want to be talking to you about, about uh, things that hit closer to home. And so these are some of those things. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And some of you know the chapter. And we're just going to be reading six verses. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 12. Why don't you all stand? And we'll go through it. I'll read it out loud. And it says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And that's the end. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks uh, again for your word. Thank you, God, that you are a God who speaks and you communicate um, clearly. Uh, you're, you're very rarely ambiguous about anything. You just make things pretty straightforward. God, we just pray that we'd uh, take your heart uh, behind these things and that, Lord, uh, as your word says, that we'd stop being, being conformed to what the world has to say. And we would have that transformation that takes place when you come in and you begin renewing our minds. Uh, we just pray that you would do that here this morning. We give our hearts to you, Lord, in the, in the time in your word and pray that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can have a seat. So we're going to be talking about, like I said, definition of the family and uh, um, actually homosexuality and abortion and capital punishment uh, this morning. And I'm going to get it all out of this. And some of you are going, really, Steve, we're going to go to the Ten Commandments for this? And um, one of the reasons that I wanted to go to this passage, because there's lots of passages that I could go to, but one of the reasons that I wanted to go to this passage specifically is because you're going to get it here as we're going through and looking at this, an indication of how far our culture has turned from the Word. People don't know the commandments, and they certainly don't know uh, the implications and direct consequences of the law that God laid out for the basic moral foundation for the first nation that he set up. And I'm being specific when I'm saying this stuff. Let me say that again. They don't know the implications and the direct consequences of the law that God laid out for the basic moral foundation for the for first nation he set up. And he set it up. You know, one, of the, one of the things that is clear about what God was doing when he set up the nation Israel is that he was setting it up to be a light to the world. That's what was supposed to be happening. You go through the book of Deuteronomy and in, in the end couple of chapters, what God lets the nation of Israel know is that they are going to be somebody that is a witness to the fact that God is in existence and he is really there. They're either gonna be a witness for good or they're gonna be a witness for evil. And what God says is either I'm going to bless you or I'm gonna bring you down. It's going to be one or the other, guys. And if I bless you, people are going to say, "How? why are these people so blessed? And the answer is going to be, be because the God of the universe, the God of Israel is the one who was behind them and he was taking care of them and the world would know that. On the other hand, God said, if you don't follow me, then I'm going to curse you. And uh, instead of being blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed when you go in and blessed when you go out, you're going to be cursed in the city. You're going to be cursed in the field. You're going to be cursed when you go in. You're going to be cursed when you go up. You're going to be cursed when you lie down. You're going to be cursed when you rise up. And God gives 14 verses of blessings and over 45 verses of cursings in those passages. And at the end of that whole thing, he says that the people of the, of the nations are going to look at the nation of Israel and say, why are they so cursed? And it's going to be for the same reasons because they did not, well, actually it's not the same reasons, it's the opposite reason, because they did not follow the Lord their God. And that's why. And so either way, people are gonna walk away knowing that God is real, whether Israel was cursed or whether Israel was blessed. But what he wanted was for them to be blessed. One of the things that um, happens whenever I go to the Old Testament on, on any kind of issue, um, I, I think you guys are more sophisticated than this, but um, you're not the only ones listening to the study. There are people on the radio 
who listen to this study. And a lot of times people will look at things that come out of the Old Testament and say, well, Steve, that's Old Testament. That doesn't apply. The Old Testament's been done away with. And anybody who has that position does not know their Bible. Because if you take that position, three quarters of the New Testament, you're gonna have to throw it out because most of the New Testament is nothing but quotes from the Old Testament and basically teaching on what the Old Testament had to say and how it applies to a Christian. And so you can't take the Old Testament and throw it away. In fact, when we're talking about the commandments, there are 10, we're just gonna be dealing with the the last ones that have, the first four have to do with the relationship between man and God, and the last six have to do with the relationship between man and man, between people. And so um, one of the things that people will do is they'll go, well, that's the, you know, in the Old Testament and stuff, And every single one of the commandments that we're talking about is reiterated in the New Testament and it's taught on extensively in the New Testament. So everything that I'm telling you, I can take take you to New Testament passage after New Testament passage after New Testament passage and talk talk to you about every single one of these issues, okay? And so it's not a New Testament versus Old Testament thing. Here's another thing. Um, one, of, one of the problems that we have with our culture, again, is that people have walked away from what, what the Bible actually says, what God's commands are. And when God writes something down in the Old Testament, he doesn't change his mind later on. There are things that he writes down in the Old Testament that are going to be fulfilled in the New Testament. So sacrifice is an example, that kind of thing. Uh, Jesus is our sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice calves anymore. And so they're fulfilled, but they're not done away with in the sense that God changed his mind or something. God doesn't change his mind. One of the things that uh, we talked about earlier is the fact that God is what is called immutable. It means he doesn't change. And so the Bible says, I do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why you're not consumed. And the idea behind that is if God changed every other day his opinion on something, well, maybe he changes his opinion on me. Right now, the reason that that I'm here on the planet is because God is good and God's gracious and he loves me, despite the fact that I can be such a stupid knothead. Um, He loves me and he's not gonna wipe me out. What he's trying to do is get me to heaven. That's who he is. That's what he's like. Well, what if he changes his mind? and decides, you know what, I'm having a bad day today and that's too bad for Steve. You know, (laughs) squishes me or something. You know, God doesn't change. And so when you're looking at at what God has to say in the Old Testament, as far as specifically morality, which was what we're dealing with, God has never changed his mind on any of these issues, never. And he hasn't changed his mind today. He didn't get to 2018 and all of a sudden decide, oh, we gotta change things. That is not how it works. And so, um, you know, let's go through and look at these things. First one, verse 12. Um, This is the fifth commandment. And it says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and your mother. That's a controversial statement as far as PC goes. Because what he just did was define the family. You have a father, you have a mother, and people who are doing the honoring which are the children, a father and a mother and children, right? World wants to constantly redefine that and they don't get to. They didn't create it, the family. God is the one who created the family and he doesn't really give a rip about what the rest of us think about it. He's the one who set it up, God did it. So when God made man, he made the first man, he made the first woman, and there were no others. And those two had children. And that is what a family is. That's a family. And it's the basis of all social structure. And you toy with it, or you destroy it at your own peril. People have been doing that for a very long time. Now we've just done it institutionally. So people have been redefining families on their own for a very long time. And now what we've done is put it into law. And when you look at the people who redefine families, what they do is they destroy lives. And it's always the case. Some of us have come from families like that, right? Raise your hand if you came from a family like that. Absolutely. And so you don't get get to do that. Um, It's been said that a family can exist without a nation, but a nation cannot exist without the family. We are on the fast track 
to a deep understanding of what I just stated. And again, it's because people have been messing around with it. Um, The passage does not say, honor your father and your father, or your mother and your mother, or for the near uh, near future, your father and his horse. This is a hugely, when you're talking about the family, important institution. It was designed by God. It's loved by him, and therefore it's hated by God. Satan. And that explains why it's under such attack. If you can create wreckage of a family, you can maim and scar people for life. And Satan is not stupid, and he knows this. And it's why the family is always um, in the crosshairs of Satan's target. When a family works the way that God designed it, it's one of the biggest blessings a person can ever experience. And I've seen some of your families. I see the way that you run them. I see the way that you treat your children. I see the way that your children treat you. And frankly, it's been, it's been something that I've learned from over the years. So some of you specifically that are in the room, I've seen some of that going on. And I watch something that I watch. And because of the places where I've come from, and probably many of you because of the places that you've come from, There are things that are not allowed in your family. You don't allow them to go on. You don't go there. And you want your children's life to be something that's different than yours. That is the way that it is supposed to go. You know, we have this culture where when somebody goes off the rails, what people do is they look back in their background and go, oh, well, the reason that they went off the rails is because their daddy went off the rails in exactly the same way or their mama went off the rails in exactly the same way. That makes no sense at all. That makes no sense at all. What should be happening is is something awful happened to me. I would never voice that upon my own children. And I would never use that as an excuse to do exactly the same thing that other people have done, right? Okay, and that's from a Christian perspective. We understand that. And so don't use that as an excuse. Your mama did something to you does not mean that you should do the same thing to somebody else. What it means is that you should be doing exactly the opposite to the people who are around you. We do not live like the world. We do not do the things that the world does, right? So when a family works the way that God's designed it, man, it's a blessing. It's a huge blessing for the, uh, the kids that are in the family. It's a huge blessing for the wife. It's a huge blessing for the husband. And you know what? Again, it's a witness. I was just talking about the witness that God made the people of Israel. God made a Christian family a witness to everybody who's around. And you know what? Again, one of the, what the world wants to do is redesign the family or redefine the family out of all existence, out of all biblical existence. At the very least, they want to make it something that it's not. And you are going to see the results of that in the lives of the people who are around you. And you know what? Frankly, they need to see something that's light and something something that's pure and something that's good. And that's what your family is supposed to be. And so you don't go along with what they're doing. You go along with the program that God's designed. This is what he wants. Um, When a family is wrong, it can be absolutely traumatic And Satan knows that, and so he acts accordingly. And so he's going to do whatever he can to destroy the relationship between father and child, between mother and child, between husband and wife, and and so on. He's going to do anything he can to wipe that whole thing out so that he can tear apart what God has designed. When you get to the New Testament, Jesus, in his answer to the Pharisees concerning divorce, um, Um, basically, again, uh, actually he definitively defines marriage to short-circuit any nonsense the Pharisees or later generations can come up with to rationalize their sin. This is what I'm talking about. The Pharisees came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 and they said to him, is it okay for a man to divorce his wife for um, any cause, for just any reason? And what Jesus doesn't do is go, yes. And what he doesn't do is just go, no. What he does do is he defines exactly what a family is. 
He, he defines exactly what marriage is. And then after he defines family and marriage, he puts anything else outside of that and calls it sexual immorality. You understand what he did? What he does is he takes away any of the nonsense that we can come up with. And he says, this is a marriage, this is a family, this is how God designed it, and everything else is sexual immorality. So I'm going to quote the verse to you. Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Male and female. And that's the words that he uses in Greek, male and female. So that's what a marriage is. And it doesn't matter what people, what anybody else comes up with. That's what God designed. Male and female, and for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. And so he defines what a father and mother is. This is straight line math, basically. Male equals father, female equals mother. Um, that's just logic. Leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And so you have a man and a woman married for life. That's the way that it's supposed to be. Not a man and two women, or a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, or a man and a little girl, or a man and an animal. God defines it, Jesus defines it as a man and a woman. He defines marriage. And then again, what he says is anything that's outside of that is sexual immorality. He does not use the word adultery. He uses the word sexual immorality. Porneia is the Greek, word, the Greek term that's used in that passage. And so that's how Jesus defined it. Lots of people will say things like, Jesus never spoke about homosexuality. Yes, he did. In the passage that I just read to you, Jesus never spoke about bestiality. Yes, he did. In the passage I just read to you, Jesus never spoke about incest. Yes, he did in the passage I just read to you. What Jesus does is he's thorough. One of the things that, that, that people get when they ask me a question is they get a thorough answer. A lot of times, you know, people will come up and go, okay, Steve, I have a quick question. Can you give me a quick answer? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> and the reason I don't know is because they need to walk away knowing, knowing what, the, what the issues are. And that's exactly what Jesus did here. He didn't just give him a quick answer. He didn't just say no. He could have just said no. It's not okay for you to divorce your wife for just any cause. And that's all he had to say was no. And then move on. But what he does is he gives him the basis for what a marriage is so that you will know what marriage is and what it is not. And again, the world wants to come up with something else. And um, what, they, what they end up doing, doing is playing around with things that God has designed. And when they play around with them, what they do is they break them. They put them outside of God's design parameters and just mess things up. And people will ask me, if two people love each other, why can't they marry? If God made them that way, who are you to deny them their constitutional right? So for example, um, God made them that way. Let's, let's deal with that first. Did God make them that way? And that would be the first question I would ask somebody. And what people would say is, yeah, it's genetic. And the reason that they would say that is because they've been reading newspaper and sent newspapers and st instead of science articles. It is not genetic. It's been, homosexuality has been proved to be not a genetic issue. And it's been done over and over. For example, there is no evidence at all for a genetic source for homosexuality. In fact, it's just the opposite. Studies done, done on identical twins and propensity toward homosexual behavior has thoroughly debunked the notion. Do you guys know what an identical twin is, right? They look at exact copies of each other. Do you understand that they're exact copies all the way down to their DNA? So one twin has DNA, another twin has DNA, and you can't tell the difference between the two if you're looking at their DNA. And yet we have twins who've been raised up in separate communities, that kind of thing, separate circumstances. And sometimes you have a, a twin who's homosexual and another twin who is definitely and completely heterosexual. That lets you know that it's not a genetic issue, that what it is is a behavioral issue. 
And it can come from situations where they've been groomed for that, you know, through their, through their, their situation or um, where they have been in a situation where they just have a bent in, in that direction for some reason or another. Um, you know what? The problem that we have is not that we've been born homosexual. The problem that we have is that we have been born sinners. That's our problem. I've been born a sinner. Some people may have an attraction towards certain behaviors. That doesn't mean that we do them. I have attractions towards all kinds of behaviors that are against what the Bible has to state. And you are very, very happy that I don't do them. And so am I, because you're attracted towards certain behaviors, and I'm very glad that you're not doing them either, much less being defined by them. And so we don't define ourselves by our behaviors. We don't define ourselves by our sin. We don't define ourselves that way. And so it shouldn't be the case in this situation either. Um, I'm, I'm glad that um, God has de delivered us from all of this stuff. And so again, you have that. One of the things that you need to keep in mind when you're going through the Bible and you're talking about these issues is that God is really squared away in the sense that he calls sin what it is. It's just sin. But one of the things that he also does is he makes it very clear that we can turn from it and we can have a life that's different. And so when I look at these issues, when I'm talking to anybody that's involved in this, this is never something where I take these verses and I just beat somebody over the head with them. And again, when you're talking about the issue of homosexuality, the Old Testament talks about it in very clear and specific terms. And we could go through the passages, but I'm not going to. I, you know, I just want to do this. And you get to the New Testament, and it's exactly the same thing. Very clear and specific terms are used in those areas, and God condemns it. And um, like, he, like he does some other things. But God always gives people room for repentance. God always gives them room for grace. It's why you're here. It's why Jesus changed your life. And so when, uh, you know, again, there, there are different consequences to different sins, and some of them have major consequences. But what God does is he delivers people. He brings them out of their stuff, and he makes them somebody new. You need to give people hope. And when you tell somebody that you're, this is just what you are, and I don't care what it is, whether it's homosexuality or drinking, or you're, you're, a, you're gonna be a thief all your life, you have a propensity towards lying, it's never gonna change. You, you do that with somebody and you wrap them up in their sin and they just stay there and it's a, it's a pitiful place to be. But God can deliver people. And he's delivered me and most of you he's delivered maybe from that sin specifically. I know guys who came out of homosexuality. I know guys who are pastors that came out of homosexuality. God can deliver people. And he doesn't care what the world says or what they think about deliverance ministries either. He doesn't care. God can deliver people. Um, let's get back to the verse itself. What's it mean to honor your father and mother? This is one of those that a lot of people have problems with, again, because of the, the situations that they came from, from their families. Um, the word honor means to give weight to. It's the idea of listening and giving a person statements, rules, and opinions, a hearing that's prejudiced toward the parent. And so when I'm trying to honor my mother, when I'm trying to honor my father, what I'm doing is I'm listening to the things that they have to say and having a prejudice towards them, have, trying to go that direction. Now, I, again, I understand you know, a lot of us come from non-Christian families, non-Christian backgrounds, and what our parents had to say, you know, especially in, in the area of Christianity, is just bogus. It's just a bunch of nonsense. And I, I understand that. Um, we understand also that God comes first. So anytime that I'm submitting to somebody, in, in this case, uh, submitting to a parent in the, in the sense of honoring them, I understand that God always comes first. So if the parent's contradicting what God has to say, then it's like, uh, you know, love you, um, want to honor you, but no. <laughs> this, is, this is what God says. It can, and again, it can be hard in the context of unbelieving parents, but even unbelieving parents have wisdom and so there are times when we need, to be, we need to be looking for ways to honor them. Actually, one of the things that happens when uh, we do uh, pre-marriage counseling around here is I specifically uh, talk to the, the couple and ask them what their parents think about the marriage. Because 
I, you, you, parents who could give a rip about their children and just want to wreck their lives are few and far between. Most parents love their kids and they know their kids and they want their kids to have a good life. That's usually how it is. And so if I've got a couple in front of me and the parents just cannot stand the guy, I want to know why. (laughs) Why can they not stand the guy? And if it's because he's a Christian, I get it. If it's because he's a bum, I get that too, right? And so, you know, again, parents love their kids. And so um, you can look for wisdom in them. Deuteronomy 27, 16 says this, cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, amen. Amen. That's exactly what it says. All the people shall say, amen. Ephesians 6, one through three says this, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And so, you know, there, there's wisdom that you can get from your parents and, and even simple things can be wisdom. So uh, have you guys ever heard the phrase, do you think money grows on a tree? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. Uh, sometimes when I was a kid, and then they would say things like, I walked to school uphill in the snow both ways. Yeah. That whole thing. Yeah, there's some wisdom there too. Um, here's, here's more wisdom. I'm the mom, you're the kid. Yeah, there's wisdom in that, right? Uh, how about this one? Because I said so. There's some wisdom there too. And if you get to that point, there's wisdom in listening to that because the next iteration may not be so great. Belts may come out, that kind of stuff. Here's, here's, here's another thing that I heard all the time. Do as I say, not as I do. I don't think that's so wise to be saying as a parent, but there is wisdom in that. There were things that my mom and my dad did that I would never do because I saw the consequences of those things. And so you have that. Here's another way that the Bible talks about honoring your parents. Did you know that uh, in almost every situation where honoring your parents is put into practice, it has to do with taking care of them when they're old? Whether you're talking about in the book of Deuteronomy or when you, when you get to the New Testament, Um, Basically, the family was God's welfare system for the poor. And so in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 5, 4 says, if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. It's the idea of taking care of your parents when they're old. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so if you don't take care of your parents, that's, that's what God says about you. Next commandment is you shall not murder. And that's the word, you shall not murder. That's the idea behind it. Um, when, you, when you get in the Old Testament, um, this is a word that's never used of animals. When an animal is killed, it's never used of warfare and it's never used of executions. And so uh, what happens with people who don't know the Bible very well is they'll take the commandment uh, uh, out of the old King James, for example, that says, you shall not kill. And they'll try to um, use that on killing ants or something or killing dogs or killing whales or killing, you know, whatever and equate that with killing a man or killing a woman, or killing a child. And the Bible does not do that. And again, it doesn't do it in the context of warfare or executions either. In fact, um, when God set up government, he did it in Genesis chapter nine. God's covenant of government is found in that passage. And this is what he says. "Um, I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life and that person's, uh, that person's life will also be taken by human hands for God made human beings in his own image. And that was, that was the setting up of government after the flood. And the reason for that was because um, everybody before the flood just did whatever they wanted and they killed people with impunity. Um, There are times in the Bible specifically when it's absolutely appropriate to kill. So self-defense is an example of this. You have this in the Old Testament, uh, not too too much later on. It talks about stealing 
And in the context of someone breaking into your house in the middle of the night, if, you, if, uh, if they did that, if the person who owned the house killed that person, they were, uh, they were able to do that without penalty from the law. Because the fact that they came in the night when everybody was asleep was an indication that they were there for more than just stealing. And so they were allowed to defend themselves. Um, um, people will take off with that and um, decide, you know, and, you know, there have been, I, I struggled with this at, at some points because I came from a rowdy background. But people will say, well, if someone breaks into my house, I'm just going to pray. And, uh, you know, I do the same thing. I'll just pray to shoot straight. <laughs> I'm just messing around, you know. But the Bible t- talks about the fact that um, self-defense is, is something that uh, God allows. In fact, Jesus told his disciples to go and buy a sword or to take a sword when he sent them out. So what are they taking a sword for? Shish kebab or something? You know? When, and the reason that they were taking a sword was for self-defense. And so God understands that. Um, execution of a murderer is one of those times that God allows killing. The Bible says that blood defiles the land and it was, that it was one of the reasons that God cast out the Canaanites. In fact, when God was talking about the Canaanites, when remember that Israel drove them out, he said, the blood is calling to me from the land. He used exactly the same language that he used with Cain and Abel uh, when Cain killed Abel. The blood cries to me from the land. And so he said, you're going to drive these people out because of that. Um, Specifically, in that case, it was the blood of infants that they had been killing. In any case, um, the the Bible talks about the fact that executions and even warfare in the case of the Canaanites was something that God allowed. You know, um, after first service, uh, one of the guys came up to me and he was a Vietnam vet. And he said he'd been struggling with this issue of warfare for a very long time. Um, one of the things that, that, the, that the Bible teaches is that the guys were warriors. Abraham was a warrior. Moses was a warrior. David was a warrior. You go through the Bible and most of the guys that, that Joshua was a warrior. Um, most of the guys that we talk about in the Old Testament were warriors. And what they were doing was they were defending the people of Israel from evil. And that's what warriors are supposed to be doing. Um, in the situation with this man, and I know that some of you may have been involved in the, in the Vietnam War, um, the way that he fra- framed it with me was he said, you know, we're fighting against VC and these guys are, you know, just guys that are there to fight with us and, and we're there fighting and, you know, it's like we're kind of being run by our governments. And we dealt with that that whole issue. But one of the points that I made with him was, do you remember what happened after the United States left Vietnam? And I, I would say that most people don't because I had to look into it to get the information. They slaughtered over 500,000 people. Cambodia was involved in that whole thing too. Over 3 million people were slaughtered. One of the things that you see throughout um, warfare, especially in the 20th century, is that when you're talking about the young guys who are um, involved in warfare, uh, another example that I gave the guy was I, uh, every two years or so we go to Israel and we go to uh, the Holocaust mu- Museum, Yad Vashem. And there is a picture in that museum that out- absolutely enrages me every time I see it. And it's a picture of a lady who's got a little baby and from your perspective, she's got this baby and she's turning her head this way, away, away from a guy who's in his 20s with a rifle pointed at her head, pointed at her face. There's a guy taking a picture, there's a guy with a rifle, and there's a woman and her child. And we know what happened to her in the moment after that picture. That's why there's warfare. And so God, when, when he looks at the, at the issue of warfare, when you get to the New Testament, John the Baptist, for example, has a perfect opportunity to talk to people about pacifism. And what he says to Roman soldiers, Roman soldiers, these were rowdy guys. What he said to them was, don't extort people, be satisfied with your wages. He doesn't say leave the Roman army. And so um, government 
has a place in this whole issue of restraining evil, whether it's within the confines of the nation or whether it's on the outside of the nation. Execution of a murderer is one of those times that God deals with the whole issue of killing and specifically killing people who have shed the, the blood of mankind. When you look at that passage in Genesis, the reason that there is supposed to be a death penalty is because God made human beings in his own image. We're not like anything else. And so that's to be honored. So executions are totally appropriate and required by God when there is no doubt that the person being executed did the act. And people all the time will have conversations with me about, about whether or not this is effective. You know, is there a deterrent fact to executions? You guys watch old movies? You ever watch an old movie? Yeah. So like 1950s movies, mysteries, you know, that, that kind of thing. And when, when you're talking about 1950s, you know, cop and, and criminal drama type thing, one of the things that you see that, that is a theme throughout those movies all the time is that a person, if they commit murder, they're doing their best to get away with it because they know that they're going to be dead within the next year if they don't. It's the idea that they have to get away with murder because if they don't, they're going to be executed within a year or so. That's how it used to be. So that's a deterrent. And in our culture, that is not how it is. In fact, when I was younger, I, um, I, I knew guys because of uh, just people that I knew and people that I grew up with. I knew guys who knew that if you killed somebody, you were basically going to be in the system for about seven years and then you get off. And so basically what they would do is look at a guy and go, is this dude worth seven years of my life? And if he was, then they would kill him. And so even if they got caught, they were only gonna be doing seven years. And you know that we, you know, in the United States, we have capital punishment, but this is how it goes. You kill somebody, and it doesn't matter how heinous it is, you kill somebody and you go through an appeals process and you're still in prison 20 years later. Well, here I am, 59. So 20 years from now, I'll be 79. I don't even know if I'm still gonna be alive. I think you, you know, it's, you're, you're almost dead at 60 anyway. So you know, I'm just, that's what I told Mitch. I mean, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. There's, there's a lot of people a lot older than me that are doing way better. In any case, 79. And so, you know, it's like I hate somebody bad enough. You know, is it worth going to prison for the next 20 years? where I get to be in a cell by myself, reading books, watching TV, eating food, everything's taken care of for me. I could, I could get to even work out with weights. I would like to do that right now. <laughs> See the thinking? And so you go, is it worth that? And that's a situation that we've got. So we don't have anything close to what the Bible says when you're talking about capital punishment. We don't even have anything close to what the Constitution says when you're talking about capital punishment. It's a speedy trial is what's supposed to be taking place, and it's not. Um, government uh, in the Bible was put in place to restrain evil, specifically with the sword. So in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, it says this, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you wanna be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So that's what governments have always been for, to restrain evil with mankind. Okay, so you shall not murder. Um, one of the interesting things about those who are opposed to execution is that many times they're gonna, they're gonna hold up a sign that says thou shalt not kill, and at the same time they demand that abortion of babies be allowed on demand. So what we do is we kill the innocent, something that's absolutely, completely 
innocent, and we protect the guilty. And that's flipping everything on its head. That is not the way that it's supposed to go. When I was a kid in school, and I don't know if they still do this, but I was taught that a baby was just a a blob of tissue and not a human until it's born. We've even got people who are advocating for the fact that a child not be called human until after it can sustain itself in the sense of being able to eat and drink and live on its own. I have a 19-year-old, or actually a (laughs) 20-year-old, who cannot sustain himself. (laughs) I'm just messing around. He's a great guy. (laughs) You know, the Bible has a lot. (laughs) The, The Bible has a lot to say about this issue. And so... You know I, know, I know that getting into the issue of abortion is, is something that's, uh, that's kind of tender with people because, and you know, I always try to be um, uh, kind about this whole thing. I know, you know, I know girls that I grew up with that had abortions. And I know that there are ladies in our fellowship that have had abortions. And I know that there, there's pain involved in this whole thing. Um, but one of the things that um, we are to do with the mistakes that we've made in our past is not just cover them up and try to make them go away. And a lot of times that's what, that's what people try to do with their junk. They just try to make it go away. And what God says is that if you cover your sin, he who, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes it will have mercy. And I'm just like anybody else um, when I've done something wrong, I, I don't want to, you know, glaringly pl- you know, paste it in front of me. But I've done enough wrong that it doesn't matter anymore in the, in the sense that my life was messed up enough that it's just there and it just needs to be turned away from. And what God does is he comes along and instead of uh, the pain that comes along with that, he gives grace and he gives mercy and he gives healing. And that's what people need. You don't need to cover things up. You don't, and what I mean by covering things up is giving all the excuses. Well, this is why I did it. This is why I did it. I was in a difficult situation. I was in this and I was in that. And that doesn't change the fact that in this instance, for example, with abortion, you're still paying for it twice a year. And anybody who's been involved in this know, knows what I'm talking about. Twice a year. And uh, that's the date that your baby was supposed to be born and the day that your baby died. Twice a year. And it's painful for the rest of your life. I I understand that. But what God wants to do is he wants to take the pain and he wants to give you mercy. He wants to take the pain. He wants to give you grace. Um, Healing for ashes. Joy for mourning is what God wants to do. In any case, Psalm 139, 13 through 16, David wrote this. He said, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. So it's the idea that God looks at at a human being and he has a plan for each and every one of them. Jeremiah 1.5, God was talking to Jeremiah and he said this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And we just did this uh, a couple, uh, last week, I think, when we were talking about John the Baptist, maybe the week before, when we were talking about John the Baptist, when Jesus comes in the room inside his mom, Jesus walks in the room inside his mom in Mary's womb, John the Baptist leaps in uh, his mother Elizabeth's womb for joy, is what the Bible says. And so he has joy inside his mom, six months a baby. You know, when, when I made my decision about the whole abortion issue, it was after I became a Christian. And the reason was before I was a Christian, I never, I never really considered it. I, you know, I considered it on some levels, but again, I'd been told that it was just a blob of tissue. And I, I'm a guy who, know, you know, I pay attention to science. I liked biology. And so I saw all the pictures. I knew what gestation looked like. 
and I knew what the different months looked like. And I don't know what was going on with me, but I was not connecting the dots between the two. And so I knew what a, what a fetus looked like when it was a month old. I knew what it looked like when it was six weeks old and three months old and so on and so forth. I knew, I knew all those things. But then at the very same time, I'm, I'm talking about abortion, uh, that it's okay up until, you know, sometime not too long before the birth of the baby because that would just be sick. And, and, that, and that was kind of my thinking. And then I became a Christian. The reason I, um, I got on the other side of this issue was not because the Bible says so. You know what I, why it was? Because somebody described an abortion to me. It was a DNC, dilation and curatage. And um, all they did was that went through and described the procedure. And as I'm listening to the description of the procedure, my mouth is falling open. I'm realizing all the implications. Nobody showed me a picture. Just so I was watching a video series, just a picture on the screen. I don't even remember what the picture was, but it wasn't of a dead baby or something. It was just a picture on the screen. And I'm listening to this description. And by the end of it, it was probably five, a five-minute description, if that. And by the end of that, I was firmly anti-abortion. I know what an abortion is. I know what happens. And that's not right. And that's where I came down to it. You know, did you know that 78% of women who view an ultrasound reject abortion? 78%. And you know why? Because it's a baby and they can see it at that point. That's why abortion groups don't want ultrasounds. They're not interested in more information. They're interested in less. They want it to remain a blob of tissue, not a human until it's born. That's what they want it to be. And so you have that. You know, as we're going through the commandments, many times people look at these commandments and we've all blown the fifth one, honor your father and mother, right? But we look at the whole murder thing and we go, well, at least I haven't done that one, Steve. At least I'm not a murderer. And this is one of those things that, that people will um, say to me, you know, when I'm talking to them about Jesus. You know, you know, I'm a good person. I've never murdered anybody. And it's like, oh, what restraint. <laughs> you are so good. You know, if half the people on the, on the planet were murderers, guess what, what? You'd only have murderers. Everybody else would be dead. <laughs> you know? And so that's not really a, a great one. Jesus took this whole issue of murder and he took it a step beyond, not just an outward act, but an inward heart. And he said this, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And what he was talking about was the fact that murder comes from an, a wicked heart. Murder comes from... Uh, unreasonable anger. That's where it comes from. And so I'm not just to be pure on the outside, I'm supposed to be pure on the inside too. And so he takes it a step beyond. And it says, you shall not commit adultery. There was a recent poll that said 93% of Americans believe that having sex with someone who is not your spouse is wrong. Isn't that good? 93%. Having sex with someone who's not your spouse is wrong. But if you don't have a spouse, it's okay to shack up. So that's 66% said that it was okay to shack up if you don't have a spouse. And so it's wrong if I do have a spouse, but it's okay if I don't have a spouse. You know, I have dogs and they are great. I love them. In fact, they're my alarms. They're, they're the reason that I don't have to t carry a gun around at night because they just go off. If anybody gets in my yard, they go, and they're labs, and so they go off. Rah, 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 they didn't sound so mean. If they ever walked in the door, they'd just lick them or something. But, you know, they, they, do, they do go off, right? And so I love my dogs, and, uh, you know, they're in the house, and probably when we first got married, Bobby, you know, wouldn't, she would have rather had the animals outside, but I like them, and so I let them in the house. Um, problem is in, on days like today or, you know, this last week um, when it's been raining and stuff, they go out in the yard. When they go out in the yard, um, they get their feet all wet and they come in and we have white carpet, right? And um, so they come in and my wife puts rugs around the, the back entrance to the house. And so, excuse me, so a lot of times when they come in, 
I'll just, I'll just get excited with them and go, hi, you guys. And, you know, and they stay around me and jump around and stuff. And they jump around on the carpet. And so it kind of cleans their feet off. I don't get down there and wipe their feet off or anything. But I do that so that they don't go tracking it through the house. Because when they do go tracking it through the house, my wife goes, really? <laughs> really? You know? I go, they live here too. And she doesn't care. Um, you know, dirt is great outside. And it's not, so, it's not so great on our carpet. This year, I'm going to be going out in the spring. My wife is going to have me rototill the garden, and we're going to put all kinds of good stuff in there. There's going to be chicken manure that we're going to throw in there, and there's going to be horse manure that we're going to throw in there. I'm going to chop it up with the rototiller, and at the end, I'm going to have no qualms about reaching down and grabbing that soil and holding it up and going, this is going to be good stuff. You know, that's a, this is great. If I took that in and rubbed it in the carpet, my wife would pray that she could shoot straight. <laughs> and it's, a, it's the same situation with the sexual relationship. Remember what I was talking about before? Jesus, when he defined the family, he's, he talked about a man and a woman for life and anything else is sexual immorality. And that's the case with this too. Adultery and fornication are wrong according to God. So in the New Testament, Ephesians 5.5 5 says, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Proverbs 6.32 says, Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. A lot of times uh, people in the world think that Christians think that sex is for um, having babies, procreation, and that's it. And that is absolutely wrong. That is, there is a whole book on sex in the Bible. Did you know this? Yeah, I've taught through it. And when I teach through it, I'm beat red the whole time. And I'm not telling you what it is. <laughs> God made the family and he made the way of making the family and he designed the human body so that it's pleasing to do so. But he also designed the boundaries um, for the sexual relationship and again, soil looks great in a garden, but it does not look good in my house and in the carpet. Does not look good there. And it's the same way in a sexual relationship. It's great inside marriage. God blesses it inside marriage. In fact, it's commanded inside of marriage. And God wants it to happen. He looks on it and he honors it. But outside of marriage, it's not something that God has designed and he will not bless it. He will not bless it. In fact, it causes problems. How many lives have been destroyed? How many children have been scarred because of the disobedience to that one command? And again, we got people in the room who can testify to that, right? So Proverbs 9, 16 through 18, uh, talking about, it's a passage that's speaking about wisdom and foolishness. And the adulterous woman is pictured like this. Actually, it's a, it's a picture of foolishness as an adulterous woman. And it says, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And as for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, stolen waters are sweet, bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of hell. And so you have that. And again, people will look at that. And the Pharisees looked at this and said, well, I'm safe with that one because I've never committed adultery. And you know what Jesus did with that, Right. And so he said, you look on a woman to, to lust after her. In your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. And so it's not just an outward act, just like in murder. It's not just an outward act. It's an inward heart that God is looking for. He's looking for a pure heart. Do you know that search engine results, when they pull those things, 68 million hits per day on porn sites. And so um, you, you have, we have a problem in our culture with pornography, filthy movies, all of that kind of stuff, um, stray thoughts at work. They're all, those are all things that God is talking about when he's dealing with this stuff. And these, th these are not things that are to be done. By the way, let me d just do one more thing before I let you go here. When you're, when you're talking about the purity of heart, um, it's an important issue that we have that because adultery comes from an impure heart and lying comes from an impure heart and murder comes from an impure heart. But the consequences for an impure heart are not the same 
as the consequences for the act. And so I may have anger for people without a cause, but I'm not going to be put to death as in, you know, in an execution because I have anger for people without a cause, unless I've committed the act of murder, right? And it's the same thing, you guys, when you're talking about um, uh, situations with impure thoughts in the sexual arena. And the reason I'm telling you this is because a lot of times people are looking for loopholes. They're looking for loopholes to get out of their marriages. And I understand that we live in a culture where this is pervasive and, I, and, and I'm not minimizing the fact that it is messed up. You, you, know, you know what, guys? You wanna mess up your marriages? You sit there and look at porn in front of your wife. You, you sit there and justify that. You'll mess up your marriage. Every time you have a physical relationship with your wife, all she's gonna be thinking of is who is he thinking of? And most likely, it's not me. That's what she's gonna be thinking. Think what that does to your marriage. Think what that does to your, to your life. And so that stuff needs to be repented of. But on the other hand, when, when, when people come in, and actually it's been both, women and men come in and say, well, you know, my husband has been viewing pornography. Can I, uh, can I divorce him? And I go, I just immediately say, has your husband been angry with somebody without a, without a good reason? Well, yeah. Okay, so should we kill him? Should we execute him? And it's the same thinking. You follow me? Okay. And so adultery is adultery. And murder is murder. And impure thoughts are impure thoughts whether you're talking about anger or whether you're talking about in the sexual arena. Those are impure thoughts. All of it is condemned by God. But there are different consequences for each one of those things. And again, it's something to keep in mind. So that's all, that's all I'm gonna get to. But again, the Bible talks about the fact that we can turn away from things. And I, I know that a lot of times when I do a study like this, this can be really convicting. And you know what, I've been a Christian for a long time, so I'm not dealing with a lot of this stuff anymore, but I have, and I know what it feels like to be sitting there going, I don't even know, I don't even know if God would want me. I don't even know if God, God would ever take me, you know, especially after what I just heard. And again, what Proverbs 28, 13 says is that if you cover your sin, you will not prosper. But if you confess it and you forsake it, that's called repentance. You will have mercy. And that's what God wants to give. He wants to give mercy. He doesn't care where you've come from and he doesn't care what you've done. He's certainly not gonna leave you that way, but he doesn't care where you've come from. And what he wants to do is he wants to get you. He wants to get you to heaven. He wants to get you right. He wants to get you into his family. That's what he wants. That's what he's interested and this stuff is in the way. And so our minds have to be changed. We need to be thinking like God does. If you had problems with those things and, and you'd like to pray about it, uh, the elders are gonna be up front afterwards and you are, you are welcome to come up and, and pray. Um, I imagine we're gonna have, I, I didn't, you know, one of my secretaries put the whole thing together. I think that we're gonna have some ladies up here to pray with also, if you'd like to come up and, and uh, pray about these things. So let's all stand. And God, again, uh, we thank you uh, for the fact that you're clear. Um, you, you speak clearly, you speak straight. And the reason that you do that is so that you can, you can give us light and you can give us hope and you can give us a life. Lord, thank you for the life that, that you've given to each one of us that are here that know you. And Lord, we just wanna walk in faithfulness to what your word has to say. A lot of times people will come to the word and they'll try to redefine things out of all um, out of all existence so they can feel good about themselves. But well, God, what you've said is that um, we can come to you and that if we'll confess that you'll forgive us and you'll cast our sin as far as east is from the west and you'll never remember it again. And so Lord, that's the kind of relationship that we want. That's the kind of heart that we want. And again, Lord, we pray for cleansing for each one of our, our hearts and our lives, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.